Hello friends and beautiful people. I am out here in the pumpkin patch this morning. Yesterday I found my first squash bug eggs. So it's a due diligence thing that I'm going to have to come out here every day and check for eggs. But you know what that means. It's time for us to talk about the birds and the bees and companion planting. So in our garden we uh, companion plant for three different reasons. One of them is to deter bad pests. One of them is to attract good pests. And one of them is for plants to feed each other. Um, so when we're attracting good pests, we identify the bad pests in our garden. Um, for me, this year the big one was the cucumber beetles and the squash bugs. The squash vine borers are another, ooh, another whole story. I'm looking at the bottom of one of my plants, sorry. Wanted to make sure that we didn't have anything going on there. But what we did this year was we completely moved where we have our uh, pumpkins. Our pumpkins are in a different location. Last year we had them way over there. This year we brought them out on this side of the grapes. Um, to uh, keep them away from anything that would have overwintered in the soil over there. Uh, we had planted two seasons in a row and the squash vine borers last year were um, a lot worse than the year before. So we were basically just feeding them. We were giving them more to eat and we wanted to just bring ourselves away from that. So Hubs took that area over for his corn and we moved them over here. One of the, the big things you wanna do though is you want to avoid planting things together that attract the same harmful pests. Um, if you've got three or four different kinds of squash and we get a lot of cucumber beetles on our squash, so we try not to plant our squash near our cucumbers. Um, it's just a bad scene because if you've got you know, two or three different kinds of squash planted by two or three different kinds of cucumbers, you're just inviting decimation, in my opinion. So, in, in my case, um, one of the things that we uh, were having issues with really bad was the cucumber beetles. Now, I do spray with Bonide, which is an organic pest control, um, just to try to Keep them from you know doing as much damage but once that bacteria gets in there you all hope is lost it once they get that in, a bacteria injected into the plant you might as well pull that that cucumber plant they're they're done so what attracts or what is the predator of a cucumber beetle so i did some research and i found that the braconid rot wasps and soldier beetles were a natural predator and since a cucumber beetle is actually native to our area, you're, you're going to have more of them, I guess is the easiest way to say it. So then I looked at what is going to attract those things so that those cucumber beetles have a natural predator. And that is kind of a, a permaculture principle that we do here. We, we want there to be animals we want them to we want there to be uh, plants feeding each other plants feeding us we, we, a whole ecosystem that works with mother nature instead of against it so that's what we did for the cucumber beetles and then we started looking at squash bugs squash bugs actually have more predators than you would guess um, the tachinid fly big-eyed bugs skelenoid wasp um, feather-legged fly and a damsel bug and a lot of people will order some of these online and bring them in and release them into their garden to uh, be the predators that they want them to be but if you don't have a food source or something else that's going to attract them then you're just throwing your money away like uh, we do with the cosmos we plant cosmos because it attracts ladybugs I'm not gonna pay for ladybugs when I can attract ladybugs, if that makes sense. So uh, there's always cosmos here. We always plant zinnias here. 
Um, dill is a great one. But, so what are the other things that you need to plant? Well, first let's talk about some of your beneficial bugs because there are times when I want to crawl through my social media page and say, stop, don't kill that bug. You need to know what the beneficial bugs are so that you're not out there just killing it because it's a bug and it's on your plant. So let's talk about a couple of them. The braconid wasp. That's the one that you see the little white um, larva on the backs of tomato hornworms. And what they do, and this is going to be really gross, is they actually eat the um, hornworm from the inside out and that kills the hornworm. It's pretty disgusting, but it's pretty cool how it works, how Mother Nature just kind of takes care of it. Um, the larva also, the larva also weaken and destroy other predators, but the big one for us was that hornworm. Ground beetles. A lot of people um, are constantly trying to uh, eliminate ground beetles. Now there's a difference between a Japanese beetle and a ground beetle. So for Japanese beetles, we actually did a milky spore treatment on our ground around the grapes and the um, fruit trees because that's where we were having the most uh, problems. Now we did have them over in the garden a little, but not like we did on the grapes. I mean, they absolutely took out our grape leaves one year. We, it was so bad that we didn't think the grapes were going to come back. So, milky spore for Japanese beetles, because that, the milky spore, if you look into it, it gets those nematodes going in the soil that then attract the larva of the Japanese beetle, or uh, attack the larva of the Japanese beetle. So, ground beetles actually control slugs. Asparagus beetles, uh, I'm, I've got notes so that I don't forget to tell you things. Colorado potato beetles, corn earworms, cutworms, squash vine borers, and tobacco budworms. So think about that. Those ground beetles that all these people are trying to kill are actually doing a lot of good. Hoverflies. Now when we were little, we used to call them sweat bees, and they're actually not a bee. They are called a hoverfly. And they eat mealybugs and small caterpillars and aphids. Uh, lacewings. Lacewings prey on aphids, cabbage worms, and caterpillar eggs. Cabbage worms are a huge issue everywhere that I everywhere I look. Um, lady beetles feed on aphids, insect eggs, and even powdery mildew. Uh, praying mantis eat grasshoppers. Assassin bugs. This is a big one because I see a lot of people who see assassin bugs, especially on our um, state's Facebook page. It, it drives me insane because everyone's like, kill them, kill them. No, don't kill them because they eat aphids, scale insects, spider mites, Mexican bean beetles, and wait for it, corn earworms. Think about it. This is why we have to soak our corn before we process it because of all the little worms. All you have to do is leave those assassin bugs alone. So let's talk about some plants. I've already talked to you about the uh, cosmos and the zinnias. And when I'm planning, and I do plan, I also plan on things that are going to attract pollinators. So all those birds that you hear in the background, every time I hear a new uh, bird singing that I haven't heard before, I get excited because that means we're doing something to attract them. And we are making an honest effort. We're part of the Pollinator Partnership. And so we are constantly trying to find things to plant to improve the pollinators around here. And we have bees and we want our honeybees to be happy. It would take, you know, hundreds of acres just to take care of a few hives if you tried to plant everything you needed for just your bees on your property. So you can't do that. But you can, because bees will fly, um, I forget if it's two miles or five miles is how far they go sourcing food. And so we appreciate the farmers here who allow the goldenrod at the end of the year to just come up in those fields and feed our, our bees because that's a great honey. So uh, one of the key things that I do every year religiously is I plant basil in with my tomatoes. Not only does that give you a better tasting tomato, 
because that basil plant is feeding the soil that the tomatoes are, are pulling all the nutrients from, but it also deters those hornworms. And since I've started doing that, I haven't had any more issues with hornworms. Catnip. I can't stand catnip. Catnip is like mint to me. It spreads. It's part of that mint family. It's, it's very hard to control, but it does repel, ugh, repel flea beetles. Borage. Now, borage is great, or borage, however you want to say it, is great for pollinators. They absolutely love it. It's got medicinal properties, but it also repels hornworms. Nasturtiums. Nasturtiums are the bomb, and I planted no nasturtiums this year, and I had every intention of planting a ton because not only are they edible, but they are great for so many pests. They are great for aphids, potato bugs, white flies, squash bugs, pumpkin beetles, bean beetles. So shame on me for not getting any planted this year, although I've got lots of seeds. Marigolds, the reason why you see so many people with marigolds planted along the edges of their garden is because of how beneficial they are. They repel cabbage moths, squash bugs, bean beetles, aphids, and potato bugs. People should have more and you should intersperse them. You can't just go around the outside edge of your garden. You really need to get some in the middle also. And the same thing holds true with a lot of these others. So if you remember, was it last year or the year before? Uh, it was 2020 when I had the amazing garden. It was because I had zinnias planted everywhere. I had so many pollinators and butterflies. It was just a blast to go out there and just watch them all feeding on those zinnias. Another one is chives. So really it's more than chives. It's also the garlic and the onions. They deter a lot and you can also make sprays with the with like a garlic spray for people making garlic spray. Chives deter aphids and Japanese beetles. So you've seen where people um, interplant along the bottoms of their grapes a lot of chives or onions that's why we were going to actually do our um, blackberries in there because um, I had read of some some benefits of putting the blackberries and the grapes together but hubs put a nix on it he didn't want to be poked by my blackberries when he was picking his grapes radishes also determine uh, cucumber beetles so we grow radishes. We start them off in the high tunnel in February. Hubs loves radishes. I like them sliced up in a salad, but that's about it. And then we also eat the radish pods. You eat them before they turn brown. They're quite tasty. But then I also um, get lots of seeds off of those guys and just keep them going as long as I can. Garlic also deters onion flies, um, aphids, and ermine moths. Rosemary. Rosemary is not native to us and that's another thing that you want to really look at when you are checking out what you're going to plant that's going to be a beneficial, what you're going to plant that's going to attract the beneficials and uh, you, you really want to make sure that you check your zone and see what's going to grow well for you, um, especially those things that are considered a native plant. For us that's going to be things like Echinacea and Rebecca. Those are great pollinators, but they're also native, and they're gonna spread like wildfire, don't get me wrong, but they're also gonna attract a lot of beneficials for your garden. But rosemary, if it is native for you, repels bean beetles, cabbage moths, and carrot flies. And I have to say, and I probably shouldn't say this out loud, I have never had an issue with carrot flies. So, um, knock on wood, knock on my head, that's not something I've had to deal with and I don't know what kind of damage they can do. The worst thing I have with my carrots is gonna be mice. And sage, I have a lot of sage growing out in the garden and it deters cabbage moths and carrot flies. So I'm thinking that, um, I, I know I'm gonna move some of that, oh my gosh, you guys, I'm being stalked. There's two cardinals sitting on the grapes and they're staring at me. Um, anyway, uh, sage, thinking about putting some of that in uh, doing a little experiment I have a lot of cabbage I want to grow next year we're good for this year 
but I'm thinking about trying it without one of my little covers on it, just doing a little sample bed with the cabbage and the sage and seeing what happens. And time also deters cabbage moths. Um, one of the other things I was getting ready to tell you, uh, it's totally slipped my mind, is, sorry about that. I was getting dive bombed by a blue marlin. So, and that's another thing that we do is we have um, places for the blue marlin to nest. And we have a blue marlin house because they are great um, pest, pest controllers for mosquitoes. Um, just like sage, if you throw sage in your, um, like say you're having a, a fire pit fire, if you throw some sage in there, that smoke is going to come out and deter mosquitoes. Just a lot of things like that. So one of the things that, I guess the biggest takeaway I would have for you is to find out what, or make a list of what your biggest um, predators are for your plants and then go out and research and find what the predators are for those insects. And what you're gonna find is that if you are looking at something like an aphid, there are so many different uh, predators for aphids, but then those same plants can also help with other, other insects that you're having issues with. So you may be able to control what you're doing by complaining and planning just a couple of different things rather than having to make this list of 40 different plants that you're going to have to companion plant out in your garden. And that's pretty much what I do. I have um, just some go-tos and then I, I try to add to it every year. And, and just like um, putting out that medicinal garden this year, one of the things that uh, was important to me with the medicinal garden was making sure that I put it close to where the bees are and not that they you know we already talked about how they can they scavenger or you know scout up to you know two or two or five miles but they've got that food source there and a lot of those medicinals are great for the pollinators and then come to find out they also attract some of those beneficial insects and um, I use the same principles when I am determining what medicinals I'm going to plant. I'm, I'm going to pick a few things that I want to take care of, whether it's, you know, coagulation or, or whatever. I'm getting way off topic. I'm a squirrel here. I'm going down a rabbit hole. But you find out that there's one plant that can do multiple jobs. And you want to be as productive and efficient as you can. And the best way to do that is just to do a little bit of research. And I'll do some more random uh, talks about companion planting and why I do things. But I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of how my mind works and what I do in order to kind of um, set up myself for my companion planting. So I know this was a lot. Take care. It's going to be hotter than Satan's armpit out here today. So I was trying to get done early. But until next time, be blessed and be a blessing.